Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me here. I'd just like to say uh, thanks to Colin for keeping me indoors because uh, I was cutting the grass the other day and I got a massive case of sunburn. <laughs> so I'm really happy that I'm in here nice and cool. For those of you that don't know me, my name's Steve and I'm very grateful uh, for being here today. Thank you very much. It's, a, it's just a wonderful event for me. And I love just getting to share my story, uh, especially with people who understand how difficult it is to just you know, keep this community alive. It's such an important thing for guys like myself. So thank you very much for giving up your time. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So as you can see, my name is Steve. Thank you for coming here. I get the right one. This was me back in 2008. My life was quite different. I was sitting, looking out the window in a house that wasn't ours. We were about to be evicted. I had no money, no job, no aspirations. I was at the point of breaking down minute by minute. I did not know what I was going to do, what I wanted to do with my life. My career had ended quite dramatically in the army. I just felt completely isolated. I had post-traumatic stress and I just I couldn't take any more. I'm sitting looking out this window, not knowing what to do with my life and what direction I was going to go. It was really a difficult time for me and my family. This is me with three of my closest friends. This is us in Kosovo. Back in two, uh, 1999, I was only 18 years old, and this was my first operational uh, deployment. While we were out there, we were doing peacekeeping operations, you know, hearts and minds, doing everything we could for the, the local people. It was such an important uh, operational tour, and being my first, I just threw myself into this. And I did everything that was asked of me, and I really felt like I was doing something valuable. And one of my favourite words in the English language is samurai. And it literally means translated to serve. And I'd always just embodied that. I just put my belly on every day, my uniform, and I felt like I was serving humanity. I was doing something in a country that I'd never even known existed. And here I was with my friends, doing something really important. Well, while I was out there, we helped thousands of people, thousands of families. And when the war ended, and the peacekeeping started. We were in a convoy one day, and the, the atmosphere outside was kind of joyous. You know, everyone was kind of up on, and, the, and their motivation was high. And the sun was sitting behind the clouds. I remember it vividly. And we were on this dirt track road in the Land Rovers in a convoy of about four vehicles. And the convoy came to a stop dramatically. And you start asking yourself the questions: Okay, what's wrong? You start assessing the situation. You've got a thousand questions going through your head. What am I going to do? Checking ammunition, checking everything. And there was something just that didn't feel right about this uh, this one time. And uh, I saw this person carrying something. And he was just, we stopped in the vehicle and he was walking towards us. He was about 30 feet away. And I realised he wasn't carrying something. He was carrying someone. And the man was about 40, 45 years old. And he was, he just looked, looked exhausted. And the thing he was carrying, this person, was a 12-year-old boy. This 12-year-old boy had stood on a landmine. He was playing football, totally innocent. He didn't know, you know, he had no involvement with the war. He was just a child, you know, a local kid, <coughs> playing football. And his legs were blown apart, you know, the blood had drained from his body. You know, you could see everything. And I was only a few years older than this guy, this little 12-year-old boy. And I just remember thinking, you know, I need to do something. This is why we're here. You know, it's not about the big picture as everyone calls it. It's about the little picture. What's going on in that moment right now? What are we going to do? And just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, his mother arrived. And the man, right outside our vehicle, dropped down on his knees and this kid's eyes were still open and they just looked right through me. And I felt a piece of my heart breaking. And his mother was screaming. The whole environment was just you know, disaster. And I thought we were going to go out and give, you know, medical treatment, you know, give watch. To be honest with you, just a bit of hope, you know, just hold someone's hand, help them somehow. And then the worst thing that ever happened to me happened. We were given the order to leave. And it just, I couldn't understand. You know, I wanted to do something. I wanted to help. And we had to get back in our vehicles and drive away. To me, that was wrong. You know, but what do you do when you're an 18-year-old lad in the army? You follow orders. 
you know, looking back now, I can see that my commanders, you know, we were going to get ambushed maybe, you know, there was other might in the area, they had our best interests at heart, but it's, you know, it's a difficult thing to, to accept when you're 18 years old. That's not what I joined the army for, I wanted to help people. So that really, that really changed the course of my life forever. Uh, fast forward a few years, and this is actually Red Nose Day in Iraq. We uh, found this portrait of Saddam Hussein, and we thought, you know, he should be involved in Red Nose Day. So, a bunch of my other friends here, you know, we keep in touch all the time, every day. And uh, this is in 2003 in Iraq, and yet again, we're out there, same old story, bunch of guys in uniform trying to make the world a better place. The only problem was uh, I just didn't feel like we were doing that because inside I was still holding on to this little kid. I could not get him out of my head. I was a little bit older now, a little bit wiser, a little bit more uh, involved. I was a, a detachment commander this time. I had responsibilities. I was now in charge of those 18 year old kids. I had to make sure my boys had the right kit, the right food. Well, we didn't have the right kit, the food was terrible, you know, our mail wasn't getting through and our boots wasn't fitting all the time. And uh, my body armour actually looked like a Arnold Schwarzenegger film, you know, it just kind of hung around here, it didn't fit properly. So it was a bit of a joke, it was quite fun. But what do you do in the army? You, you've got the best of what you can get, and you do the best you can. You just get on with it. You don't moan, you know, you don't sit idolising, you know, oh, this isn't fair, why are we here? That's, that's not... You know, that's not what we do. We just get on with what we've been given. Well, I was sat looking at that window, the uh, reporter who actually took that picture, or the, the crew that took that picture actually, you know, wrote about um, the difficulty that me and my family were going through at the time. We were facing eviction that day. And on uh, Christmas Eve, we got a knock on the door, just in that same property. And we were handed an eviction notice. You know, I'd, I'd seen some of the worst things I could possibly come through. You know, I tried to make the world a better place, and here I am being presented with an eviction notice. You know, I've been medically discharged from the army, you know, ignored, you know, ostracized in a time where in the media, yeah, heroes are amazing, but what they're not seeing is the little picture. Everyone's got this big picture. But what about the person who's struggling, who no one else sees? Well, that was what it was like for me and my family. And at that point, we just could not take any more. And I realised that it was all my own fault. Everything. All of it was my fault. I'm the one who was in charge of my family. You know, we're not in the army anymore. It's my responsibility to make sure that my family have got the, you know, the needs that they, they must have. I'm the father, I'm the husband. It's my duty to make sure that you know, they are having a, a good day, a good week, a good life. And I realised that all the crap I was going through, I was worth more than this. And I was going to change everything. Let's take a quick drink here. <laughs> so I decided, instead of just thinking this, I'm going to act on this. Me and my wife decided, you know, we're not the only ones going through this. How do we, how do we get this community again? I've got friends who are struggling, they're leaving the army. We've all got these unspoken wounds that everyone keeps talking about. Post-traumatic stress, depression, suicidal tendencies, alcohol, drug, prison. Something's going on inside. Something is happening. And we're not talking about it. Why not? Because of stigma? Because of fear? Because you're scared that someone might point at you? Well, I'm beyond that now. I'm past caring. Time is for action. And I promised myself that I would never stand by that road again and watch something as Impossible like that could happen, but do nothing and leave. I was going to make a difference because I'm worth more than this, and I believe other people are. So we set up a little uh, community called Unspoken Wounds on Facebook, and it's growing. As you can see, the numbers are increasing, and we are having such an amazing community that are just inspiring themselves. It's not about us, it's about the community, it's about them. The numbers are growing, the people involved are you know, important. And, you know, if you can just take a bit of time, check it out, you know, it's, it's about you guys. I'm sure some of you might have seen this. If you've not, please get in touch and have a look at it. Through the course of doing this and deciding that I was going to change my life and my families, we started getting involved with some fantastic people. As you can see here, Rory Brenner, Stuart Proudfoot and myself, 
uh, a couple of years ago we were involved with the launch of Bobby Scotland and uh, it was just such a turnaround for me to realise that it wasn't just about me. I'm not just the only person struggling here and I can do something, I can make a difference. Getting to stand here and speak, it's such a privilege. Um, I'm not a speaker by nature, uh, my wife would disagree. <laughs> um, but I do like to stand here and think, you know, I have a voice. I want to be someone who can represent a community that, you know, right now is struggling. And uh, this is something that I'm, I'm passionate about. You know, I'm motivated to do this, and uh, I really want to help as much people as I possibly can. And working with Poppy Scotland has been such a privilege. And I'm very, uh, truly, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. And I continue to do this because it's, you know, it's important to me. Uh, I also help. Uh, now I'm consulting and teaching and lecturing at Robert Gordon University. A wonderful team of occupational therapists there, and you know the work that they are doing for veterans is so important, so important. And uh, you know, giving keynote speeches at graduation and stuff. You know, I'm so lucky, and I get to look back at myself and think, well, I'm, I'm doing something now. You know, I'm making a difference. You know, and if it wasn't for people like yourselves, I, could, I wouldn't be inspired to do this. I also have a nine to five job, you know, when I'm doing all this. As you can see, I've got a very clean environment to work in. It's, uh, you know, I'm not pushed, you know, the, the hours are really easy. Mm -hmm. I love my job, I do. It just suits me down to a tee. I'm right in with the mucking the oil with a bunch of guys, you know, that are daft and silly as me. We have a good time at work. And we're doing something worthwhile, producing oil and gas, you know. And uh, I find that that environment suits me uh, perfectly. Uh, They've got that dark sense of humour, you know, it's uh, evident throughout the whole industry. And about 80% of offshore are actually ex horses. So you know what we're throwing pipe in a hole and drum for oil and gas, we're having a, a bit of a banter on the, on the rig floor, so it's just fantastic. On the horizons now, we've got a book coming out, you know. Um, I'm hoping to kind of share not just the, the good points, but, you know, the pretty bad things that happen to us, so that we can hopefully can entice other families out there, not just individuals, but families, that whole community um, of veterans and people serving, that you're not the only one going through this. And while you're going through it, no matter how difficult it might seem, there is a way out of this. You don't have to sit bury your head in the sand. You can't achieve you know, things that you do believe in. So what about the future? We've covered quite a lot there. You might be thinking, oh, this guy's busy. Well, I'm just getting started. <laughs> set up a company called Reactivate. I believe inside every person there is a voice, an idea, a sense of something that you want to achieve something with your life. Why are you here? You've all given up your time today for something, for some reason, and I believe that inside every person or every family or community there is something waiting to be reactivated. Something inspiring, something transparent, something collaborative that we can all get in touch with. Uh, it's bigger than me, it's bigger than all of us. I really think that you know, together we've touched on some important subjects today. And the theme I keep hearing is together. Because I can't do this alone. I can't do this on my own. I don't want to. And I think everyone here you know, is quite evident that you're all sharing that same idea. We've got a strategy set out. How we're going to shape the future and our ideas together with unspoken means and reactivated with the book, speaking. We just want to kind of share, look, people are in forces, they come out, they're having a difficult time. We can all do something. I'm just one person, I'm one family. You know, I've got an idea of what I think is capable, what I think is possible, and I'm acting on it. Because, quite honestly, I feel compelled to. Because if I was to just sit idly by, it would feel like that day in Kosovo all over again. And that would be a waste of time. You know, and I'm not going to stand by and let that happen. Reactivate. Basically, we can achieve much, much more than success. It's about reactivating that inner drive and passion and using it to make the world and our lives a greater place to play in. And that's something I believe in. Just before I, I stop and take some questions, I would just like to reveal something that burns me, that's passionate, I, that drives me every day when I wake up. It used to be about putting my belly on, putting my uniform on, you know, and I miss that, I do miss that. But a man needs something to, to drive with. He needs something that inspires him. You know, he keeps that aliveness because for so long I just lost everything. 
driven by alcohol, driven by excuses, driven by a need to feel a victim. You know, that ruined so many years of my life and I refused to live that way for the rest of it. I discovered something when I was at the bottom. Something quite elemental, something quite simple, but powerful at the same time. And it drives me every single day. Basically, ladies and gentlemen, it's the idea that there is always something we're fighting for. Thank you very much for your time. And any questions?